our next presenter. He is a professor of medicine, University, uh, uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He holds the Rudy Jacobson Chair in Pulmonary Fibrosis, and he has uh, made sentinel contributions not only to uh, pulmonary hypertension, where he runs the familial program at Vanderbilt, but also in uh, pulmonary fibrosis and the genetics of pulmonary fibrosis. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Jim Lloyd. Thank you. Thanks, Greg, and thanks for the wonderful opportunity to participate in such an exciting conference. It's really uh, wild, I think, in my experience. So you've just heard about what we can hear from the future. My job is to tell you in 20 minutes about where we are now, what's clinically available, and the current status of uh, clinical genetic testing. I wanted to make it clear from the start that I'm not a geneticist. I'm a practicing pulmonologist and that I do have a bias for single gene disorders. That's where one mutation in a gene and one gene can have a major impact. And the reason I'm most interested in those is because they're actionable. We can test for them, we can counsel about them, and they can even be prevented in future generations in certain circumstances. So what is genetic testing? Genetic testing is a type of medical test that identifies changes in chromosomes, genes, or proteins. And basically, uh, it has two major applications. Uh, the results of a genetic test can confirm a suspected genetic condition. So that's a patient that you're talking about. Or it can help to determine a person's chance of developing, i.e. in the future, uh, pa or passing on a genetic disorder. So those are two very different uh, circumstances clinically. And I think we think of genetic testing as uh, the latter of those. But uh, when we're using a test to confirm a clinical diagnosis, I think of that as a diagnostic test. And for instance, for the clinicians in the room, when you see a patient with bronchiectasis, and if you want to know if it's cystic fibrosis, they don't have to see a genetic counselor before getting a CF panel to see if it's CF. So when we're using the currently available panels to make a diagnosis, I think that's very different. Certainly whenever we're counseling unaffected individuals that are at risk in families, then they should spend a lot of time with a genetic counselor. Fortunately, you're gonna hear from Janet Talbert next, who's the leader in the field in IPF genetic counseling. But uh, that certainly is important. And I wanted to make the distinction from the start. So we've been interested in genetic testing in IPF for quite a while. We find that at least one in five patients that come to us with IPF have uh, family history, uh, and it's a familial. Only half of those is an apparent at the start. So we've had several patients who come, their doctor told them that it's not familial, they go and find their cousin's death certificate on the second visit, they come back and say, my cousin had IPF too. So when they're educated and come back, often early on, our experience is half of those will find out that they have a family history they often didn't know about initially. But then the second case in the family may take a very long time before it shows. And part of it's that I've been at Vanderbilt for a long time, but uh, we've had as long as 20 years uh, before the second case in that family showed up. So a lot of what we think is sporadic, it's the tip of the iceberg, and there may be familial disease underlying it in about 10%. About 20% of all families now, we can find a specific uh, identifiable gene mutation. We'll talk about some of those but 80% uh, are still not yet identified, uh, even uh, despite having similar characteristics of uh, transmission and others. And you'll hear more about the upcoming genes, how many of those are uh, existing that have rare variants that may contribute, I think are yet to be defined, but it's probably dozens or more. So I, as you've just heard from Jeff, uh, sequencing even an entire genome is relatively easy these days. Uh, and now, uh, in this day and time, there are gene panels, usually based on whole exome sequencing. So you can get the sequence really quite easily. And the expense is generally covered by most insurers. Uh, so uh, reliable results are available in a few months. So that's the easy part. The less easy part is uh, all of the uh, features that go along with uh, what do you do with the sequence. So patients should be educated before. Uh, the uh, typical way that geneticists have recommended genetic testing really for any disorder is to visit a counselor to be counseled, uh, come back again for the second visit to have the sample drawn after having thought about it. Uh, 
and then come back for the third visit to uh, receive the results. And when it's been looked at in other diseases, there's dropouts at every stage as patients think more or individuals think more and more, do they want to know what, what, what value is that information? Um, and then there are other features, decision to uh, receive the result uh, is the final step, but then the impact on the family and the decision to tell the family, all are important components. So one of the most important things that the NIH done is, has done, aside from what you've heard earlier, is the genetics home reference. And it's an excellent resource that I would recommend to everybody in the room uh, that's available online. And I've uh, just pulled one part of it from uh, Help Me Understand Genetics that talks about cells and DNA, how genes work, genetics and human traits. So any of you can go to that website. If you Google it, it'll come up. Uh, but it's extremely valuable, I think, and so I recommend it really to all IPF patients to learn about the genetics because we've seen so many patients who come back and say, oh, my cousin just had IPF. So I'm going to talk about a few of the genes that are known to contribute in IPF. In the interest of time, we don't have uh, time to discuss many of them, but uh, basically there's two major pathways that are known at present. Uh, all of them have dominant inheritance. The telomerase pathway genes we'll talk about are telomerase reverse transcriptase, RTL1 and PARN are the ones that make up the bulk of uh, the known genes. That's about 20% of all the uh, families with IPF. And then there's several uh, listed in the next row that make up about 1% each. They're very important. If you're in a family where that's the major mutation, that's the important mutation in your family. But um, it's not among the bulk. And the same for the surfactant protein C genes, although it's only 1% of the uh, mutations, it has a uh, very important effect and important for scientific knowledge about where the disease begins. Surfactant protein C is in one of the 40 cells in the lung. So that tells us that the alveolar epithelial cell is the important cell in that disorder. I'm not going to talk about other uh, disorders that contribute to IPF for lack of time, but there are recessive genes, ABCA3, and there are probably others. And you heard about MUC5B or TOLOP, other common uh, variants, and uh, those are very interesting and important uh, components, but we don't have time to discuss them today. So in my view, the genetics of IPF begins with Phil Bonani. He was a wonderful internist at uh, Rochester, New York for decades. Uh, he's shown in the bottom in 1965 when he was a resident reporting the family that's shown in the pedigree. There were eight patients at that time uh, in 1965. That's a more current photo of Phil uh, shown there. And uh, you can see there's a pair of twins that are in that pedigree. They were reported in 1950. Uh, and so Phil contacted the family, followed up on them and reported the eight patients 20 years ago, when we started to work on IPF and families, I thought, well, why not see what he knows? And so I called Phil. He was extremely helpful, was very gracious, and told us he still followed a gentleman in that family who helped uh, a medical student in our lab begin our IPF and families program. And as Marty reported the family follow-up at Aspen in 2001 and showed that there's clearly vertical transmission. That means it's one gene that's important that's, uh, when it's passed from parent to child. And you can see father to son transmission excludes sex linkage. So we thought that at least many of the families were going to be autosomal dominant. And in fact, that was correct. It was that support uh, from an individual in that family to Annis that allowed us to build our cohort. And the very next year, Alan Thomas, a really brilliant fellow in John Phillips's lab and at Vanderbilt, identified surfactant protein C as the first mutation that was the basis for IPF in families. Uh, and in this large Canadian family, Alan showed a L188Q mutation in SFTPC. They had 12 adults and uh, three children at the time. And so that was a, a very important first step in understanding the genetics again. So that's 15 years ago that we began to understand some of the rare variants in genes that uh, participate and are important and, and available to be tested today. Ten years ago, Mary Armanios at Hopkins uh, made the next uh, serial and I believe the most important observation so far in rare variants in genetics of IPF uh, when she reported telomerase mutations in IPF. 
So you've heard earlier, I think, that the telomere is the uh, cap on the end of the chromosome that prevents it from unraveling. Uh, so it's critically important to prevent DNA damage at the tip of the chromosomes each time every cell of the trillions of cells that are in your body replicates, then uh, the telomere will shorten if the telomerase is not active to help uh, keep it uh, a normal length. And there are dozens of enzymes in the pathway. I mentioned several earlier, uh, but the telomeres are a critically important structure for cell function. So I'm uh, reluctant to talk very much about telomeres because you're going to hear later from two of the world's leaders, Mary, I mentioned the others, Christine Garcia, are going to be talking. I think this session has actually been moved from the original plan. It's this afternoon, right after lunch. But they're the, really the world's leader, in my opinion, in uh, telomere-related lung diseases, especially related to ILD. Part of that was, uh, for Mary's experience, is uh, derived from this family. Uh, so all of the telomerase information comes from a rare disorder, dyskeratosis congenita, that's been known for 100 years. But about 20 years ago, it uh, became recognized that it was due to mutations in this pathway. And this is a family with dyskeratosis congenita. The grandmother in the top circle was 65 years old and died with IPF. The next generation is 40-year-olds with a variety of different conditions, uh, including uh, bone marrow disease and liver disease, as well as pulmonary fibrosis. And the, the next generation is teenagers and 20-year-olds. And so this is a phenomenon known as genetic anticipation, where the disease gets younger in subsequent generations. Uh, so that's very concerning, I think, in why this family has genetic anticipation apparent from its pedigree and why um, Fortunately, we do not see this phenomena in the 35 families with TERP mutations that, or at least not commonly see this phenomena in many of the families. So I think it's especially important to try to understand what the mechanisms are for telomerase mutations such as this. It's the same mutations, but there must be something else that, that governs it. But um, the, one of the other critical features is the grandmother had practically no other features of telomerase disorders. And I think it was that experience that led Mary to think uh, back in the middle of the last decade that uh, maybe IPF in families, even when there's not a full phenotype of dyskeratosis congenita, uh, might be caused by mutations in telomerase. And, and she showed that in the paper that I showed you. Uh, there were six families with telomerase mutations, six in turd and one in uh, the RNA component of telomerase. So we can identify these families and patients just in clinic, just from the clinical diseases that they report. And so uh, it's not just IPF in the family. They may have other idiopathic interstitial pneumonias in the same category, NSIP, nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis, or cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. But even disorders that are not traditionally thought to be in this uh, category, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis Greg mentioned earlier, or even connective tissue diseases seem to be more common in these families and whether there's some link there that we don't know, I think it'll be exciting for uh, the different groups to understand that. But individuals with cirrhosis or bone marrow disease may happen in the same patient, in IPF patients, or in their siblings or other relatives. So that's the phenotype for telomer telomerase pathway genes. Surfactin protein C also has a very fascinating and separate phenotype uh, and it may begin, unlike all the other families, even in childhood, even as young as age one or two in the family. I showed you earlier, it seemed to be triggered in children by viral infections, influenza or RSV, but uh, surfactant protein C can present at any age in life, even young children. And it's very atypical that it can have a course for many decades. In that family, there was a gentleman who had disease from age five until he died at age 55 with interstitial lung disease. So, and there are several other reports of very long courses that we would not accept as IPF in general. I wanted especially to mention one very tricky part about the telomerase pathways. And I think that this is not being clinically emphasized enough because of it uh, breaks traditional Mendelian genomics, genetics. And, and that's because uh, telomere length doesn't only relate to the telomerase mutations that I told you about. It relates to the length of the telomeres that all of us inherit from our parents. So you begin life with telomeres and then of a given length inherited from your parents and then those 
uh, may or may not be ma maintained depending on whether you have the enzymes that uh, maintain that length. And it's the telomere length itself that's the determinant of disease, not whether you have the enzyme or not. So this leads to this occult genetic disease, as Mary and her mentor described it, where non-carriers in telomerase mutation families may inherit short telomeres and disease, uh, despite not inheriting the family mutation. So this doesn't follow the rules. It's very tricky. And it means that anybody in a family with telomerase mutations might be at risk, even if they don't have the uh, specific mutation. Mary and her mentor, Carol Greider, who received the Nobel Prize for discovering telomerase in the 1980s, uh, showed very carefully in elegant mouse experiments that it's the length of the telomeres that relate to the tissue renewal capacity, not whether they have telomerase or not. So I think that telomere length is a very important component of uh, characterizing risk for individuals and families. Shown here is from Mary's paper in 2007, telomere length. So it's age on the x-axis, and uh, as we all age, our telomeres get shorter. The top uh, line is uh, the 10th percentile, and the middle line is 50th percentile. So non-carriers in black, and you can see that most of the non-carriers are, are 50th percentile or higher, and all of those who are mutation carriers are the red dots are uh, less than 10th percentile or even less. But the reason I pointed out is you see a few black dots down uh, at the zero percentile line. And so those are patients that we would believe probably have the occult genetic disease. And uh, others uh, have shown, uh, this is work from Christine Garcia, the red arrows at the uh, in the telomere graph at the left show the open circles who are non-carriers, who with, even without that mutation have very short telomeres. And Christine, and, and really elegant work in this paper in 2011 showed that they certainly can have disease. And we've seen that in several of our cohorts. You'll hear from John Kropsky and others later. I think there are 65 families with telomerase pathway mutations now in our cohort. And, We've seen several of them have severe disease and very short telomeres and not have the mutation. So it's very counterintuitive, and I think it needs to be taken into effect by genetic counselors around the country. Uh, telomere length is measured in dyskeratosis congenita clinics, and so I think it's very uh, confusing and confounding uh, in the ways that it presents. So it confounds genetic counseling of individuals, but it also then makes it very difficult to link a specific gene defect to a disease uh, because the traditional genetics relies on the mutation being segregating with disease. And so it's confounding in several features. Fortunately, it's possible now clinically to readily measure telomere lengths. Uh, so they're readily available clinically and they're relatively inexpensive. It's just a flow cytometry for the, the best method, I think. So it's a send down, we send them out and the, the, the tests are available in two weeks. Uh, and you heard earlier that short telomeres are a risk factor and a, a prognostic factor. And so I think we're, as we learn more and more that telomere lengths may have many applications, uh, especially in IPF. And so <clears throat> I've listed the four groups that I think clinical testing might come up as a question. So if there's a family history negative, then those are sporadic patients. Again, 10% of those might have or 10% of the familial might present as sporadic. And then there's familial where there's two or more patients in a family but don't have a specific phenotype or then there's specific phenotypes for specific gene pathways. In the past, I think uh, we would have focused uh, testing on just whether there was a specific pathway, but now several labs offer the availability of exome sequencing and looking at all the genes, the surfactant genes. And what's important to me is that many of those labs are now being reflexively adding all the new genes as they're reported. So traditionally, it, we had to wait several years before a lab would bring up a test for a new gene defect, a new one that's added. And so I think the ability to do the most current testing of all the genes that are known and reported and convincing is, is certainly possible. Telomere lengths, I think, uh, uh, there could be a good argument for measuring it in all of the individuals in those four groups. And we use it, in fact, to help trigger uh, genetic panels. Uh, if telomere lengths are very short, less than 10th percentile, uh, 
in a family, even without a telomerase phenotype, I think that enhances the possibility that there's a telomerase phenotype at the basis for that, and, and uh, that might be convincing evidence to go ahead and send a panel. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, and Janet may talk about, uh, testing results and interpretation and explanations are very difficult. The honest truth is the only conclusive result is when you turn up a positive test that's a conclusive mutation. Uh, so that's helpful, and then I think uh, if it segregates with disease in the family, then, then that is very helpful to be sure that that provides all the value that's, that's possible. Of course, the real hope is that the same thing will happen uh, that's happened with cystic fibrosis. So it took 25 or 30 years before specific therapy was developed knowing the gene defect. Uh, and perhaps IPF is a more challenging disease in many ways than CF, but now they have a specific medicine that goes right to the heart of the chloride tran channel transport. And so I think those things are possible for surfactant protein C or telomerase disorders. If you get an inconclusive result, a variant of unknown significance, then that's uh, not conclusive one way or the other. Uh, and even if a mutation is not found, that's not conclusive. That just means that um, it does not mean that one does not exist. It just means that it wasn't identified. Uh, maybe it's one that hasn't yet been reported, or uh, there are many ways that it, they may be tricky to detect. And knowing a specific rare variant in a family uh, then allows the identification of mutation carriers and individuals who are in those families who want to create a family of their own can have their can have their own biologic children uh, and uh, without transmitting the uh, variant of interest in certain and sometimes expensive uh, methods. So in conclusions for current genetic testing then uh, gene panels are available and, and uh, covered by insurers. I think they're more and more appropriate for making diagnoses in families where genetic counselors are not required. But when testing unaffected family members, uh, then they need to think through all the ramifications and carefully be counseled. I think the genetics home reference that I mentioned earlier is, uh, is an especially valuable resource. They can go at their own pace. It's meant uh, for anybody to read and understand. And I would especially caution uh, clinicians in the audience about occult genetic disease and, and um, the trap that may happen for specific individuals where they don't have the mutation, yet may still have very short telomeres and be at risk for disease. So we've, uh, John Kropsky, who you're gonna hear from later in the day, put these into a perspective that's published in the Blue Journal uh, recently, and I think represents all the things that I've told you about. Thank you for your attention.